Auto Web. Welcome to the Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast, Auto the number one resource for automotive sales professionals, managers, and owners Auto Web. to learn how to make money, accumulate wealth, and to all out ball out in the auto industry. And now, your hosts, Sean V. Bradley and L.A. Williams. One, two, three, four, five. Auto Web. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is L.A. Williams, and I am here on the Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast. And of course, y'all know I got my main man to my right, Mr. Sean V. Bradley, the Millionaire Car Salesman. What's happening, Sean? What's up, brother? You know how we do. Absolutely. We're about to go in today. (laughs) Yeah, we got a phenomenal guest. Uh, And the cool thing about this guest is, you know, we we got the radio show. You guys are all familiar uh, with Against All Odds. Against All Odds. (laughs) Yeah. I gave you a sneak preview before. um, But this... This gentleman is seriously, I mean, he is successful against all odds. I'm going to have Sean introduce him because he's friends with Karen. Kind of break that down to him, Sean. Yeah. So our special guest is John McSherry. What's up, brother? How you doing? What's up, man? Thank you for having me. For sure. So as LA just said, you're friends with uh, the queen, my wife, Karen Bradley. Mm -hmm. Uh, And what's kind of funny, they went to school together, like what? Yeah, like middle school. (laughs) Yeah. Right, so that's wow, blast from the past. Yeah, yeah. Karen had shared with me, you know, his story, which was just inspiring. And so that alone made me want to be able to reach out to have this interview. But I don't know if you know this, LA. I did a pre interview with him uh, last week and I got to really find out some things, but I'm mm. not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spoil, spoil it for, it, the, spoil for it. the audience. <laughs> So we're, we want to get in. But before we do, I want to before we find out who he is and why people should care on this podcast, I want to remind everybody the purpose of the Millionaire Car Salesman podcast and even our, our new show against all odds radio show is it, it's we're here for one reason to to basically consolidate all of the information that we feel is the most powerful resource, most powerful inspiration, most powerful motivation, most powerful blueprint strategies to help our listeners do more, be more, and <clears throat> selling more cars more often, more profitably, whether that's you know generating more appointments, getting more appointments to show, get more appointments to buy, or it's building your brand or accumulating wealth. That's what we are focused on here. So, and I'm here to remove excuses because I don't want to hear none of those. Yeah, before yeah, you don't even know. I'm getting I'm getting like visual advice from the blind dude here. You know what I mean? <laughs> the blind lead the blind. No, the blind's leading the stupid over there. Yeah. <laughs> blind dude's pretty smart. So. All right, so John, let's start with tell us a little bit about like who you are and your background. And remember, this is not Match.com profile. So <laughs> <laughs> you sure? <laughs> yeah. So you know. I am a real estate investor and a real estate broker in New York, but I actually started my career as a graphic designer. So I started somewhere. I fell in love with real estate investing and ended up becoming a full-time real estate investor. And really, you know, the reasoning behind having me on the show is I think we talked about how, you know, we make money in our businesses, but it's important to really invest that money so that we can create long-term wealth, passive income and all that. And that's, and that's something that I did through becoming a real estate agent coming over from design and then becoming an investor to, to create wealth and actually generational wealth and um, passive investments for my family. Listen, no, no, no. Like, that's great. But now we want to know why should we give up mm, to listen? Sure. Why? Yeah, no, because what you told me, which I was blown mm-hmm. away is tell them yeah. about the struggle first. What's tr- I said he sounded like he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He must have had a whole bunch of money and everything. He went to real estate investment school, and is that kind of what the story was, John? Were, were, you, were you born? I wish. Well, funny enough, when I was originally born, right, my dad actually did make a lot of money, but he was a compulsive gambler, right? He was involved in some things, ended up losing everything, and ended up unfortunately dying very young. So it's funny because. I was born with a lot, then lost everything and had nothing and ended up homeless, became an alcoholic, living in Philadelphia, somehow made it through college. Actually, they kicked me out, but I talked my way back in because my father passed away. They gave me a pass, Um, somehow finished. And I had a, I luckily I did have money given to me by the school because of my artwork. I was a graphic designer, so I didn't have any money, but the school basically paid me to go. And uh, my father died while I was in school. So graduated college 
father died, ended up homeless, had nothing. So that's where it all began. Yo, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. Did you know that Karen was homeless? No, I had no idea. Yeah, Karen, uh, her dad went to prison for three years and uh -huh. Karen was homeless. She lived in the Salvation Army and she bounced mm -hmm. That kids used to make fun of her and her brother, you know, because they used to drop her off like on the school bus stop mm. was the Salvation Army. And so right. one of the big things that, that Karen has in her heart is that she, that's why she created Help Because You Can. And we did a, a tremendous amount of stuff for homelessness and for, you know, the Salvation Army. So we did this whole mm -hmm. big, huge campaign where we raised tens of thousands of dollars. And plus, we also... Wow a lot of different um you know things like on amazon gift store like uh tents socks sleeping bags you know a bunch of stuff and then we went we created like almost like 75 gift packages and, and went to center city philadelphia and just handed mm -hmm. them. and so my point to this is that you know a lot of people don't realize how real homelessness is and mm -hmm. how close the average american I, I saw a stat recently is is roughly about three or four paychecks away from being homeless yep. so if i'm understanding you correctly you you had money and privilege your dad had some some issues some demons lost it all mm -hmm. uh and you know at some point you hit rock bottom where you mm -hmm. were not only homeless but you were an alcoholic and you know you weren't really happy with yourself and, and with the prospects of of the future correct 100 percent. so if if you don't want me asking and this is sensitive stuff mm -hmm. but this is real you sure. know you go from 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 the bottom, you know, mm -hmm. and again, it takes one to know one. You already know my story. <laughs> so I'm saying this out of love and mutual respect. I mean, mm -hmm. like I have mad respect for your story because, you know, it's so easy to to blame, you know, the world like that, you know, damn it, my my dad or damn it, you know, this or damn it, that. And and, and it's easy in this in, in our mm -hmm. in our life to, to make excuses to justify, you know, our problems, our mediocrity and play the victim. Mm. What what did you do to click? out of that, that victim mentality, that codependent mentality, and, and change your, your, your situation? Sure. I think that's a great question. Probably the best question I've ever been asked. So thank you for that. Um, really, it just came from, you know, hitting that bottom. And it's funny because we had a conversation about Grant Cardone before. And, you know, hearing it in hindsight, it reminded me of what I went through. And even I think I heard this when I was in the AA program is that you kind of have to hit a bottom to be able to push off and catapult to the top of of a pool, right? Let's say you're sinking, you know, in order to really catapult, you need to hit rock bottom to push off, to get the energy and to get just that, you know, just, just spurt of energy to, to just fly to the top of the water. And that's kind of how it was for me when I hit rock bottom. Um, I needed to completely humble myself. I needed to completely reinvent myself. I needed to just find appreciation and love in all people and just really just reinvent my entire way of thinking, you know, I read a lot of great books and I had a great mentor, which was my aunt. Like my aunt let me move into a garage. It was actually half a garage. I talk about this a lot. Like she, she renovated half the garage into a little room because she had a live in nurse for my aunt or for my grandmother while my grandmother was dying. Um, so I moved into that room and it just allowed me to humble myself. You know, like I was working in nightclubs, making pretty good money before that, but I was drinking all the time and partying and just really destroying my life. So I really needed to just be knocked down to rock bottom, humble myself and just start, start brand new. So on that, w was there something, you know, that like you hear this from people that they, they had that epiphany moment, something happened, you know, they lost something. Cause I, I could picture it. I could see you in, in this half apartment in the garage, you know, but is something that happened like, were you like tired of eating like, you know, peanut butter and jelly? Was it, <laughs> you know, a girl dissed you cause you didn't have any transportation to pick her up on a date. What was it that pushed you? I, I understand there was mm. probably a series of things, but was there one catalytic moment that was like, ah, the hell with this shit. I need to get my shit together. I mm. can't, I can't do this no more. Do you have that? Is it like a gradual thing? It was a gradual thing, you know, like I, I remember, you know, I had a bike and my aunt put me into like an outpatient, you know, counseling program. And I remember I would ride the bike and then somebody stole my bike. So then I had to walk to get to the program and, you know, I didn't have a bike. I didn't have enough money to take a bus. Um, and a lot of my other friends were out partying and like they had jobs. But for me, like I knew I had to really take a step back, really humble myself and live this humble life to really start over. But I think, you know, I think it was a culmination of everything and just really being sick and tired of being sick and tired. And eventually once I got into a 12 step, sick and tired. <laughs> okay. And then once I got into a self, um, I wouldn't say a self help program, but like a 12 step program, um, 
And I had a spiritual experience in that program that, that just completely gave me hope. It gave me um, a group of people around me. The good thing about going to something like AA or some sort of 12-step program or support group is you have other people around you that are going through the same thing. You have people to talk to. You're able to see visions of success of other people getting through depression, abuse, drug abuse, abuse, alcoholism. And I think by seeing that and, and, and meeting people that became like brothers to me, I think that that really helped me understand that there was a way out. Wow. You know what? That's really deep. Uh, LA, I want to, I want to focus on that point right yeah. there is, you know, being part of a network, a community, wh- whether it's for support, camaraderie, understanding, you know what I mean? Because you heard that phrase, it takes one to know one. Well, it does, you know, yeah. addict, right. you can understand another addict and alcohol, mm. uh, some of the suffering from alcoholism could, could understand and empathize with another alcoholic. Whereas unfortunately, sometimes people that are not facing those similar demons are, are not mm-hmm. as empathetic or understanding or patient as right. some going through that and walk through the same fire, you know, of hell to get to heaven. So I, I think that's really strong. So w- what I'm getting out of this is a couple of things. One is that there, there doesn't necessarily have to be one, uh, catalytic moment that is going to have a paradigm shift. So people, if you're, if you're going through some shit, don't just keep going through it and waiting for that magic one moment Thank that you. says step, stop, drop and roll. Like, you know, you're on fire. You need to turn on and start paying attention to all the other inertia that's happening your way. Yeah. The, another thing I got, I'm going to turn it over to you all in a second is I heard that you got help from your, your aunt. And that's important because we all need, you know, somebody, you know what I mean? When we're born, we're born completely helpless and dependent on our parents. And unfortunately, the circle life, as we get older, we regress back into depends and, you know, in, in senior citizens, daycare and things like that. You know, being dependent on somebody isn't a problem. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, Tim Cox from Carnell, and we would love the privilege and honor to be able to partner with you, our dealer partner, and show you why we continue to be the most awarded communication and digital retailing platform in automotive. What's the buzz about? We'd love to show you why. Please click the link below and let's partner together. People need to check their egos, uh, men, women, whomever, and understand that it's okay. It, it doesn't take away from your manhood or your womanhood to be able to ask for help. And it sounds mm-hmm. like you got support from not only your aunt, thank God, but also from this 12-step program. You know, mm-hmm. you were supported on in different angles, on the home front, on, on a clinical front, and it kind of helped you get to that next stage. LA? Yeah. No, absolutely. Because I know for me, right, um, first of all, you know, someone always helped me out of it. I remember leaving my own house. It was crazy. I don't even know my story, right? Left my own house, uh, ended up, you know, kind of going back to stay with my step pop for a little bit and then end up renting a room from a uh, old halfway seat out lady, right? She my buddy though. So mm-hmm. I won't call her that. But I mean, I think the key is that, like you said, you don't wait until you hit some sort of rock bottom. You make a decision. And once you make that decision that this is it, you create your own rock bottom. And see, some people don't really realize that. See, if enough is not enough for you, then you keep on sinking. But when you get to where enough is enough and you're going to absolutely turn around your life, you can do it. It's called hypnotic rhythm. I don't need to get into, you know, outwitting the devil. Napoleon Hill wrote a book where it's all about mm-hmm. hypnotic rhythm. When you're going down a drain, it's real simple. You just keep it going down in circles, right? But as soon as you make the decision that you're going to jump stream and you're going to go mm-hmm. upstream, then it'll, it'll begin to happen for you. So I think so many times people don't make that decision or they wait too long to make that decision. And now it's like, you got to go further and further. So what do you think about that, John? I I think that's great. And I was thinking to myself, going through this and looking back at it now, like my bottom was the greatest gift, the biggest blessing that ever happened to me, even though it was the hardest, most difficult time that I've ever experienced. You know, I've, I've overdosed. I've basically been resuscitated three times. I mean, I basically have lost my life three times and I've been brought back for a reason. And, you know, if I didn't go through that, <clears throat> I would have been okay living a mediocre life for the rest of my life. Like I really had to hit that bottom to want something better that now I can't turn it off. I can't turn the drive off. I can't turn that fire off inside, but I really have to suffer. So if you guys are going through something right now, you know, use that as the fire, use that as your motivator. Um, and don't, and don't get down on yourself. It's like, you could always start over. You, you could always start fresh and start your life over again. And I mean, for me, I was 26 years old. It was in 2006. And 
I thought my life was over, really. And um, I still had a chance to start over. And I know people starting over in their 40s and their 50s, so it's never too late. You just got to start over. And one more thing I want to mention is not only that after you have this experience and and you get the help, um, not only is that important, but one thing that I learned is that in order to keep what you have, you have to give it back. The only way you're able to keep what you have is to continuously give it back. And that was something the program told me was that once somebody sponsored me and told me what to do, I then had to sponsor other alcoholics and kind of coach them along. And just the fact that I had to hold somebody else accountable held me accountable. So I think by giving back is also a good way to kind of stay in this and to keep growing and, and getting better every day. Listen, this is really powerful because I could totally relate to you, John. Uh, what you mm-hmm. said is that what you went through, that bottom was a, was a, is an incredible gift. Man, I lost six years of my life before. I, I- it's crazy. And so mm-hmm. I'll tell you a quick story. I was mm-hmm. in, this is 1996. Okay. And you can Google this, this is legit. I was in MCC Manhattan federal. Okay. So that's where I did my pretrial in the feds. I don't have County jail. They have federal pretrial. And I was in the cell. I got into a fight mm-hmm. and it was all good. You know what I mean? And I went to what's called administ- administrative segregation ad seg or the whole, and you know who my cellmate was one of the freaking mm-hmm. Al Qaeda terrorists that blew up the <laughs> center in 1990. Oh my goodness. 1993 wow. time they blew it up. So I'm sitting there in federal prison in New York City, MCC Manhattan is the name of the facility with a, an Al Qaeda terrorist. And I thought that my life was over because I was facing like 20 years and all sorts of crazy stuff. And I thought that, you know, uh, my life was over and I contemplated ending my life. And I thought to myself, mm-hmm. you know what, if I am in the same place as a freaking al-qaeda terrorist if this is what the most the united states government can do besides execute me and i only had an ecstasy case you know what i mean so they're not going to kill me over that but i could handle this and my point is i would never recommend anybody go through state or federal prison or any type of prison or a boy's home but that helped make sean bradley who he is all the violence all the poverty all the neglect all the drama as a kid It made me the man that I am, and it made me the husband I am and the father that I am. Sometimes we have to experience things, and those things will help shape and mold our paradigms, our behaviors, and our reality. L.A.? Mm, Yeah, absolutely, man. Everybody has a moment. Yeah. Moment. But like I said, it's up to you to create it. You can't just wait for something like that to happen. Again, we have all these stories and each of us can give you the moment only because we made the decision in that moment. Because think about it, Sean, it's possible, right, for you have went to the hole and hung out with him and then kept it moving, right? You see what I'm saying? It didn't even mean anything to you. And so many times that happens to certain people, right? I could have been in my situation and so what, right? You could have been in your situation, John. So what I got? So what? Somebody stole my bike. Oh, well is me but it's the decision that we make in that moment that changes everything absolutely all right so this this okay so now now you earn my respect now now you deserve (laughs) time now i now want to because if i'm a listener especially in Mm -hmm. our audience if you're an automotive sales professional you are an entrepreneur etc you're just trying to be a human being and then go through life and we have this guy john who's a real estate investor Okay, okay, he might have some information, but you know what I find is even more interesting and even more satisfying is to hear a person that is as successful as you are. And yes, you're going to get into some tips right now and how to manage money and real estate and all that stuff. But the fact that impresses me the most, more than your subject matter expertise, is your resilience, your perseverance, and what you what you went through to where you're at now. To me, that is priceless. Being able to articulate that to to in, and to inspire other people listening. So I want to thank you so much for sharing your your personal background and it's impressive, man. Okay, so with that being said, let's transition. Okay, so most of our our our, our listeners are automatic automotive professionals. They're car salesmen, car saleswomen. They're automotive sales managers, general sales managers, GMs, internet directors, BDC directors. And what I want to focus on is, is this. We're going to go in a different direction, mm-hmm. John, for a second. Is I've been okay. freaking 20 years. It drives me crazy <laughs> that the damn automotive industry is behind the real estate industry because you guys are, you know, in my opinion, a little foo-foo. You know what I mean, like you got... You- <laughs> houses and stuff like that. And unless you're selling Bugattis, it's a different world. However, the thing that I always impressed me about real estate agents was that they knew the second that they're done with their real estate school and they got their license, they are their own business. They have to market, advertise, prospect, generate referrals, et cetera. Whereas at a dealership, 
it, they're stuck on stupid. You know what I mean? What happens is, is they turn around and they, once they finish and they get certified as a product specialist, then they wait for the magic up bus. Up means an unsold prospect. You know what I mean? Like a, like a, a prospect, right? So they wait for, and it's a, it's a jargon in our industry, a magic up bus, meaning a magic mm-hmm. bus is going to magically drop off prospects for your edification. So tell, tell me what the psychology is because you were, you were a real estate agent as well too, correct? Yes, correct. Okay, so when somebody decides to get into real estate, like I, I guess in school, when do you learn that there's no magic leads that come through that you need to turn around and build your own business? Talk about that for a little bit. Well, first, the failure rate of a real estate agent is like 95% within the first like you know two to three years. It's really, really high. And a big part of that is because, you know, it looks easy. People are like, oh, you know, I could just jump in and you know, show people houses and make money. But, like, nothing is really handed to you unless you join a team. Um, you know, for me, I started part-time while I was working that design job, and I slowly crept my way in. Um, I kind of wish I would have started full-time sooner, but, I mean, that's my story, and that works for me. But for other new agents that want to get in, I always suggest to maybe join a team, join a team that has a bunch of listings and a bunch of experience so that you could do open houses, get some buyers from them and all that, and really kind of jumpstart your career. But for me, my business really didn't take off until I hired a coach. And that coach was like, I want you to do two things. I want you to make videos every day, post on social media, and also make cold calls. I was like, those are two things I don't want to do. I was afraid of the camera. I was afraid of calling. So, but, but then I was like, I'm paying this guy you know, 500 bucks a month and I'm not doing what he said. So I started doing what he said. And at that point, my business started to take off. It's just outbound prospecting. And and that's really how you build your own business through social, uh, maybe through print mailers and also through cold calling. And that, and that's how you build it. I see a couple of nuggets right here. So, he said, hire a coach. What? Exactly. Right. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like that, that is so foreign to automotive professionals, except in, in our mm. military. A lot of us, you know, that are in this group are, are reaching out to Dealer Synergy, Bradley Demand, and they're doing just that. But I just think that's really incredible. So well, you're telling me that as soon as you got your real estate agent license, before you were making money, you on your own found a coach and you're paying this person $500 a month to give you real estate business development skills, ideas. What made you think about that? What made you decide, you know what, I think that I need to go find a coach? What, what gave you that idea? I mean, I've heard a lot of stuff. There's like some coaches out there like Tom Ferry and these other coaches that have been around for a very long time. So I've seen their social media content and seen emails throughout my brokerage. But I actually saw that a friend of mine had success and his coach was like, thank you to my coach. I got my deal. You know, we did whatever million dollars of, you know, close sales this year. And then I saw the coach comment. I was like, maybe I should reach out to that guy. So I reached out to him and, um, you know, it just – You know, it just really changed my way of thinking. But it wasn't only the tips that he gave me. It was the accountability, which I think is a very important part of it. And it's only when you're paying somebody do you really take that accountability serious. Absolutely. Because, you know, you just said it. You said, man, I'm paying $500 a month and I don't even listen to this guy. This is crazy. I got to make some changes. Mm -hmm. So, wow, that's that's impressive, John. So there's two things I got out of this. One is not only did you know that you have to build your own business, but you're like, I don't know how to build my own business. So let me get before I could start building my own business, generating referrals and making a lot of money in real estate. I need to turn around and find somebody that's a subject matter expert in this field and learn and get mentored and coached by that person and be held accountable by that person. So that was obviously a successful strategy for you because you evolved, correct? Big time. Yes, correct. So to back to the original question that, that, uh, that wasn't clearly answered, I apologize is, you know, so is that something that real estate companies like back in the day, Century 21 or Remax or whatever it is that they say to people like, listen, you know, real estate is your own business. Don't get your license and just think that we're going to give you leads. Do they condition you right from the door that you have to learn how to build your own business and be entrepreneurial? What is that? What is the culture like in real estate? After these messages, we'll be right At the very first dealer e-process keynote, Gino Cipperoni and Sam Vukas introduce new tools and strategies to drive conversion, new designs to increase customer engagement, and new technologies to dominate the competition. Visit dealereprocess.com forward slash keynote to watch and see what's new in 2021. 
So the problem is a lot of brokerages don't really provide great support and training. And that's what I was saying about a team. It's really important to join a team because I feel like you need that individual kind of support, which is if you're going to start a real estate, join a team to really get that support or hire a coach because the brokerages, unfortunately, don't really provide great training. The company I work for, they do provide great training, but most companies don't. Um, so, but 95. they do market it as, right. But they do market it as be your own boss, this and that. But one thing I tell people all the time is, yeah, it's great to be your own boss. There's no ceiling to how much money you can make, but there's also no floor where when you get started in real estate, you're already, you know, two to $3,000 in the hole. You got to pay for insurance, MLS access and everything else. So that's why I'm saying it's really important, important to get around the right people, either join a team or, you know, uh, hire a coach because you really are not going to get that kind of support from your brokerage, even though they market it as be your own, you know, boss and be a business owner. There, there really is no business. So you really need individual support when you get started. Okay. So let's just say that, and I, and this is a specific question. Let's just say that I wanted to get into real estate, right? And I know this mm -hmm. is for salesmen and managers and owners, but I want to right show you how would a how would you advise me as a as a newly licensed real estate agent to start my business if i was like john look mm -hmm. you know i got a dollar and a dream you know what i mean so mm -hmm. help a brother out how do i start you know building my business give me you started to say it before but i want you to structure it with this question how do real estate agents or how would you advise real estate agents to start to prospect and generate referrals so Again, I would say join the team, but if you wanted to do it on your own, I would really focus on the cold calling. I'd focus on marketing. Um, for me, also social media is a huge part for my business. And something I always tell new agents is talk to everybody and tell them what you do. And that's something I kind of like came up with or maybe heard somewhere maybe 10 years ago. But I've always said that even before I got into real estate, when I was looking for design jobs, is just talk to everybody. And really, it's about getting as much attention as possible. That's really what it comes down to. Everybody needs to know who you are. And for me, I post on social media every day so that when anybody thinks of buying or selling real estate, I want them to think of me. And I don't like sell people say, hey, I'm John McSherry. I sell real estate. Here's my phone number. I just say, this is what I'm doing. I document what I'm doing. I show that. And even before I had any success, I would go out and show like document showing buyers properties. I'd say, hey, I'm out today. I'm showing buyers properties in Queens. And this is what it looks like. Look at this beautiful kitchen. So really just for me and what I find that works well, especially in today's day and age and in today's, you know, real estate world, document what you're doing, show people, give away free information and just try to find ways to help people. All right. So let me cor correlate this towards automotive people because it sounds exactly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, exactly parallel. It's one, it's it's create content, you know, for videos. Create a YouTube mm -hmm. channel and creating videos, whether these videos are how to set up, you know, your satellite radio, how to set up OnStar, how to sync up your Bluetooth, you know, how to use the climate control and the BMWs, how to use the hand gestures, you know, again, uh, what if this happens? What if that happens? You know, what do you do if a check engine light comes on? How do you change your oil? How do you change your wiper blades? I mean, you could create a massive amount of content. And once you have this content that's created in video format, in article format, or in infographic format, then you could start syndicating this content through social media, email blasts, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So content mm -hmm. creation and content syndication is, is what you're saying. And the other thing I got from what you just said is also, you know, just describing what you do day to day. So if I'm a salesperson, I could do walk around presentations of the vehicle. I could show them, you know, uh, you know, the pros and cons of this and that. So that's, that's awesome. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. I got a for you and I want to use this for Bradley demand, right? So, uh, so for my editors listening on this one, Here's what I always say for car sales. The car sales, most states, unfortunately, not every state, but most states, you are allowed to do what's called a bird dog or pay for a referral. Um, unfortunately, I think that the average dealership is 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 really super cheap, and they only pay like a hundred dollars on average for a bird dog. But I've got good dealerships that I work with that they give a like give two hundred or even three hundred dollars referral. So if I said to you, John, John, if you know anybody that's in the market for a vehicle. All you got to do is, is shoot me the referral. I'll do all the work. If I sell them, I will cut you a check or give you cash 200 or 300 bucks. That's a referral that's, that's compensated. I've always said that, that real estate agents 
are one of the best people that you can set up as as bird dogs or referral agents as a car salesman because they understand because they're commission based for the most part like you are and they're in front of a lot of people or have access to a lot of people. So let's play this out. So John, the real estate ninja and Sean, the car ninja, right? Mm-hmm. If, if, if I just reached out to you and said, listen, I know that you, John, you have a great real estate business. First and foremost, if I know anybody that's looking for real estate, I'm going to shoot them to you. So I'm going to refer them to you. But I'd also like a reciprocation on that, meaning mm-hmm. that if you know anybody that needs to buy or sell or service their vehicle, shoot that lead over to me. And if they wind up purchasing a vehicle, I'll pay you you know, up to $300. John, do you think most real estate agents would jump at that? Wait a minute. Before you answer that question, I, I, just speaking of which, if you know anyone that likes podcasts, and <laughs> I'm asking you, I guess I'm asking you to share this podcast. I'm going to ask you to leave Definitely. it because that's exactly how we grow as a podcast. <laughs> now, I don't know about $200. I don't know if we're doing that, but no. we can figure it out together, y'all. <laughs> so again, what he's saying is if you like the show, make sure that you subscribe to the Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast, you uh, leave a review for it. But now, John, back to you on this. What are, mm-hmm. you, what are your thoughts? So you think like the average real estate agent would be excited to be able to partner with an automotive sales professional who's got access to a ton of people buying cars? Yes, definitely. I think that's something that they would definitely be interested in. And I know there might be certain state regulations with getting referrals, especially with real estate. Um, but maybe incoming might be fine, but I would say to check on your state laws. But I will say that I do have relationships relationships where I get referred real estate and then I refer cars. So it's like an even kind of thing where we refer services to each other and we do a ton of business together. Um, I know from state to state, there may be different you know laws and stuff like that. John's saying is, is what I just kind of touched on before, but he went a little bit deeper is that in certain states, you know, it's illegal to turn around and financially compensate somebody for a referral that turns into a sale. So in those situations, they just, you know, reciprocate business. So where there's no money exchanging, but if I'm the car guy and John is the real estate guy, I might just be, you know, pumping him and, and forwarding him a bunch of referrals for real estate. And in return, you know, he obviously wants to keep the you know the hand that's feeding him very very happy so he's letting me know everybody that's in the market for a vehicle so at the at the very simple level there could be a bi-directional you know strategy created for for real estate and automotive referrals but then in in most states though if you're smart you'll take advantage of the financial compensation because if Mm -hmm. if real estate agent and I could not only get real estate referrals, but I could also get a two or $300 check or cash from a car person. Why not? And in the flip side, um, in certain states, don't real estate agent pay referral fees to referral agents as well? Yes. So in New York, you can only pay a referral fee to another agent and vice versa. So if somebody gives me a referral and even if it's coming from Florida, but the New York state realtor laws, because I also sit on the board of realtors on a state, national, and local level, um, the average referral fee is 25%. So you could actually make a lot of money as a real estate agent just by giving referrals, and that's it, and, and just make a ton of money and never show a single property. And you may have similar opportunities within the car sales business as well. All right, strong. Okay, so this is good. So there's there's a lot of you know mutual uh, opportunities to generate you know uh, bidirectional referrals and even potentially potentially uh, bidirectional referral actual cash fees. Okay, let's now right. get yep. you know, the the next level of the conversation is. For automotive professionals, um, you know, one of the problems they have is being productive. And this is what Karen specializes in time maximization organization. But I, I would assume that that's the same challenge for real estate agents because you make your own schedule, you make your own time. How do you advise people to time manage or, you know, maximize their production? What do you advise for, for real estate agents or automotive professionals? Well, I'll just tell you two things that really inspired me to have better time management and higher productivity was I read two really good books. Uh, One was the five second rule, which is where you're able to start things when things that you don't feel like doing, like maybe cold calling or maybe going door knocking or stuff like that, which I thought was inspirational. And also the miracle morning book, which helped me start early, start a very productive, successful day, starting off with exercise and eating healthy, jumping into my cold call. So I think by implementing healthy habits is the best way you could succeed at any sales business. Oh, strong. Okay. Fire. Fire. 
So, okay, I love this. Next would be, let's just say that the average salesperson or real estate agent for that matter, um, like you said, 95% of real estate agents fail within the first couple of years of them being in business. But I, and you said these, I, I heard you said that they start about like at least $2,000 in the hole, right? So let's say- Pretty much. Mm-hmm. Check. And sometimes with real estate, you could have a figgity fat check. So what's mm-hmm. your advice on how to be fiscally responsible? You know, whether you're a real estate agent or an automotive salesperson, it's the same thing. You're commission based. And sometimes you get mm-hmm. figgity fat checks and then you don't want to get hood rich and buy dumb shit like rims, you know what I mean? And things like <laughs> right. that. Um, but so what advice do you have for people that, that find themselves with a lump of, uh, of cash from a, a, a big commission check? How do you suggest that they should invest their money? Sure. Well, I would split that money up into three separate buckets. One, tax, because in real estate sales, which may be similar with car sales, but I'm not sure, but you pay the government later, which is one thing that I like about you know sales and investing is that you get paid first, reinvest that money, and then pay the government at the end of the year or the following year. Um, the next bucket will be to, so like, let's say you split it in thirds. The next will be you know, to reinvest in your business, to market, to get more business, to prospect, to, to do flyers, to do ads. And then the other would be for personal use and personal investing. So that's something I do. And honestly, a lot of what I do is I reinvest everything I make back into investing to create more passive income flows. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hundreds of dealers have switched to VinQ in 2020. For a limited time, VinQ will match any special trial offers the other guys are throwing out there. With VinQ, replace five systems with one solution. Market pricing, inventory management, wholesale, and private party acquisitions, advertising, and reconditioning. Don't miss out on the chance for better data, increased churn, and higher gross per sale. Stop competing on price alone and start competing on value with VinQ. Request a live look at VinQ.com. I love this. In the automotive industry, they take the taxes out, so they're not LLCs okay. or nine. They're they're there. So I would say it's similar to what you would say. Like, and so the Sean Bradley dealer synergy millionaire car salesman mm-hmm. philosophy is three buckets as well. But the first bucket is invest in yourself. Okay. So what I mean by that is like you, like you did yourself, John, the getting a coach. I think that the, the best investment you can do better than your, your business and better than, you know, other people's businesses or investment, you know, portfolios is investing in yourself in education, whether that's in mm-hmm. training, that's personal development or professional development. I suggest that you invest in yourself. Second would be invest in your business, grow your business marketing, advertising, branding, client retention things that you can do. Mm-hmm. Instead of just trying to get new clients, new clients, try to keep your clients and you know get them to stay longer, buy more product or buy more real estate or whatever it is and refer yep. all friends and family. And then the last one would be is once that you've stabilized yourself and you stabilize your business, then you can now look to accumulate wealth and, and exponentially you know increase your, your portfolio. So um, I, I love that. LA, do you want to touch that? Yeah, no, you absolutely killing it. I mean, because it, it, there's always buckets. That's the whole situation is you got to have a game plan. I think the three things that people lack in, and I teach this in personal finance is number one, folks don't have an education, right? And you're listening to the podcast, so you're getting educated. But the other thing is folks don't have a game plan. And, and what I'm talking about is a written, you know, put it together game plan. And then the third thing is a, a coach, right? And that's what we're look. That's what we're talking about right now. You got to put together the education, the game plan, and the coach. And those three things, I'm telling you, it's the trifecta. I love it. Mm-hmm. So now let's talk about the uh, the man, the myth, Mr. Grant Cardone. This is, is funny. Uh, when I told him we were officially partnered with Grant, he was like, really? I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, dude, for years now. And I've known Grant for like almost like, what, 13 plus years, something like that. Mm-hmm. So tell us what you're like, like you've been really inspired by Grant Cardone, correct? So tell me mm-hmm. what yeah. you knew about Grant Cardone and what do you like about Grant Cardone? And how does that, how does, how does Grant influence you? Wow. So big time and inspired me in many ways. And um, I was actually listening to a podcast like this one. It was called uh, Bigger Pockets, which was one that I loved for real estate investing. I started listening to it, I think, in like 2012. And I forgot at what point I heard that Grant Cardone was on there, but just his tonality and his energy and his ideas just really caught my attention. It was unlike any other real estate investing podcast that I ever heard. And so let's say I probably heard it five or six years ago. And at that point, you know, I was still working my design job. I was... I was growing my real estate agent business and I was 
and I was investing. I was buying a couple of properties a year, whether it was with partners or on my own. And he kind of introduced this different idea where like you make a ton of money and then you invest it all into large multifamily real estate. And that actually kind of changed my perspective. Originally, I just wanted to flip houses and um, I didn't mention it, but in 2011, I went to like a Rich Dad Poor Dad conference with Robert Kawasaki and that inspired me to get into like flipping more heavily. But then when I heard Grant Cardone, it really helped me focus on that long-term wealth and flipping, building up that capital, then dumping it all into multifamily, which is what I'm doing now. I've done flipping and the agent stuff for a while. And now we're accumulating large multifamily buildings in Florida. So that was a big part of what inspired me. And then I read, you know, the 10X rule and then all those books and that, and that really helped me out with my uh, real estate business. So here's, because obviously being partners with Grant and just like, you know, mm-hmm. watching and seeing what they're doing, talking to Jared, the president of uh, the Cardone Enterprises, is that's what Grant does. Grant makes a tremendous amount of money, like hundreds and hundreds of mm-hmm. millions on his education, on his on-demand training, on his, you know, conferences and, 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 and everything. And then he takes all of that money and he invests it all into Cardone Capital, you know, buying, you know, real estate and, and just it's at a whole nother juggernaut level. So to the point where he is, you know, the, the season three on the Discovery Channel's undercover billionaire with close to two billion dollars in, in real estate assets. So my, my, my thing here is that I know a lot of people in the automotive industry that are car salesmen, car saleswomen, managers, not even the owners, just like the, the employees of dealerships are becoming millionaires or multimillionaires because they're investing in real estate. And I believe the stat is that 90% of all millionaires in this country invest in real estate. So can you talk about how powerful real estate, um, whether it's flipping or it's wholesaling or it's you know, uh, multifamily you know, uh, rentals, how powerful is real estate in accumulating wealth and, and putting you on a fast track to becoming a millionaire? Well, I mean, I'm actually involved in all... And all of them, you know, I flip, I have a wholesale business that we wholesale in, in six states. And then we have the long-term buy and hold business as well. And um, I think it's all part of the picture. And for some people, like if you don't have a lot of money to start out, maybe start off with house hacking, like buy a house, move into a room, rent out some rooms to your friends, do whatever you can to get a mortgage, start paying down principal, build equity. Um, I think that's a great way to start for anybody. Um, if you want to really get started in investing, you can start wholesaling or looking for flip opportunities, but you definitely need a good coach or good real estate agent partners to kind of help you find the right deals so that you're not overpaying for a property so that you can hire the right contractors. And, and then after you do that, I think you should get into the you know small, medium to large multifamily buy and hold. I think it should be in that order. Start small, house hack, maybe flip a couple of houses and then look for the long-term buy and holds that'll pay you and your family for, for the rest of their lives. Like you want to look for that generational wealth, but you have to start somewhere, start small, just buy a primary residence house hack and go from there. Okay. So when you're saying house hack, remember, I'm not a real estate guy. Define <laughs> what that means. Sure. Mm-hmm. Basically it's a term that I heard in bigger pockets many years ago, but basically it's a good way to start investing where you buy a house as a primary residence. So if you buy as a primary residence, you can buy a house with three and a half percent down. So if you're buying a house for a hundred grand, you can buy with closing costs for under five thousand dollars. Buy that house, move into a bedroom, and let's say you're a young single guy, it's a three bedroom house, you could rent out each room to your friends for five hundred bucks so that they'll have cheaper rent. And your mortgage will be paid 100%. So now whatever income you have coming from your dealership business now goes right into your pocket, not into your rent, not into your mortgage, but it goes into your pocket that you save to now buy the second property. So that's kind of a a house hack way to start investing. It's not necessarily a flip or an investment property. It's a single family house that you could kind of work it out to make it a great investment somehow. Okay, that's that's freaking awesome. And so, if I'm hearing you correctly, the the path that you suggest is house hack, or and or find your initial property to be able to flip. Mm-hmm. Can you just tell us on average? You know, let's just say that the average car salesperson makes around fifty thousand dollars a year. Okay, and so that could be a nineteen year old kid, that could be like a fifty year old man. You know what I mean? Whatever. But if, if they're making about fifty thousand dollars a year, um, how much money would they need to put down potentially for an average? flip for an average person what are they looking at to put there so i think it depends on the state that you're in you know i i live in new york and a lot of the flips here that i buy are the acquisition is between 300 and 500 thousand and i usually put down about 10 percent 
Um, and then I sell that for 500 to 800. If you're in parts of Florida, you may be able to buy a flip for 50 to 100. But I use hard money, which is basically high interest rate money that I could get within a week or two with while putting a little bit of money down. So I would say try to save about 10% of what you think the purchase price is. But um, you should definitely talk to some local agents in the area to, to see what flip properties are going for. Every state is different. And um, but I'd say if you could save maybe like 30 grand or 50 grand. Let's mm-hmm. go back to what you just said. So in Florida, sure. we could possibly buy a property for 50,000 or 100 grand, right? Let's just say 100 grand. Right. If I'm going to buy a hundred thousand dollar property, um, I'd have to put about ten percent down, which is about ten grand. You said hard money, so um, it, it, does that mean that I would have to come up with the ten thousand dollars cash, or maybe uh, I could get three thousand dollars cash and then get hard money somewhere? How does that work? I'm confused. So you would need ten percent of the purchase price. So if it's a hundred thousand dollars, you would need ten grand. Plus, you would need some points, some fees, some percentages for closing costs. So figure another like five grand. So Potentially for about $5,000, you could probably buy a $100,000 property in Florida. Really? Depending on the area. Yeah. Okay. So, and then, and how much, like I'm buying. So from you now, obviously if we don't know what we're doing, there's an issue, but someone like you, if you bought a property for a hundred grand in Florida and you're paying five to $10,000 out of your pocket to buy a hundred thousand dollar property, explain the process of the flip now, now, now what? So let's just say it's November 1st. You just closed on, on the property. You own this property, whether there's a mortgage or you own it in cash, whatever you do. Now what? Like how, like what's the next steps for you? You got to find a contractor to, to, to rehab the place or, or modify it or fix it or do whatever. Uh, how long does that process take? And then how much after you, you flip it, how much money would you on average would walk away from? Okay. So let me give you some real examples. So I'm buying, I'm buying about eight properties this week. Some with partners, some by myself, some are multifamilies. Uh, there's one property that we're buying, a little bit of a different price point. We're buying it for 200000 but the after repair value, like after it's put on the market, is about 350 okay? So this house specifically does not need a lot of work. So I brought in a partner. We're going to buy it with hard money. We're putting down 10% of that plus closing costs. That's all we really need to come up with plus the interest payments. We're probably going to put about ten, fifteen thousand into it. We're going to put down new floorings, new paint fix a couple of things and then put it back on the market. The good thing about Florida is that you can close on properties in a couple of weeks. In New York, it could take about three months. So we're going to be closing on that this week. Um, we'll probably sell it by the end of December or early January. Um, we may just list it a little bit lower at 320. So figure in about two months, buying for 200, we'll put about you know 15,000 into it and we'll sell it for 320 in January. Worst case scenario. So, are you familiar with the Burr strategy? Or do you, do you? Yes. Thought process. Yes, but I don't really do that too much. It's the buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, that's pretty amazing. So, again, if my math's correct, that's that's approximately a hundred thousand dollars that you'll be able to make, you know, within sixty days. That's pretty crazy. Correct. Attention auto dealers, you need an opportunity to do business to do business. AutoWeb is one of the largest suppliers of high quality leads, I mean high quality buyers. At a 10% closing ratio, you will be at less than $190 per car sold. Don't just settle for what you get. AutoWeb can fully customize your results through targeted markets and or zip codes. And as a partner, you will get premium placement within search results. Who better to do that than literally the people that invented automotive internet sales? If you want to sell more cars more often and more profitably, then you need AutoWeb. Okay, but then, but you know, somebody's going to start out small. You know, it's all relative. It's it's scaled. You know, depending on how much the property is you acquire for, depending on how much you have to put into it, depending also how long it takes to get it sold. Right. Theoretically might be good, but if you're incurring cost, you know, in a 30, 60, 90 day, you know, gestation period, that's going to get factored in. But the whole strategy is that you're taking money from just sitting there in the bank or in some type of account. And instead of investing it in 401ks or in, you know, IRAs, you are your own investment strategy. I like that. I like not depending on a broker or another company. You know, I like being in control of my own destiny. So I think that's really right. Now, 
do you think that it's realistic that somebody could, you know, work 40 to 50 hours a week, you know, or more selling cars and on the side, you start investing into real estate? Yes. I mean, that's how I started. And it took me a little longer because I did it part time. Like I told you before, like I was doing a lot of things. I was buying and selling restaurants. I was a broker. I was doing this and that. If I would have started full time, you know, it would have happened a lot quicker, but I started part time. But you don't have to do it alone. You can look for an investor partner. Let's say that you are working full time, 40 to 50 hours a week. Why not partner with another agent? or another investor that has time, maybe you put the money up and the partner uses his time. So there's a lot of ways to get around working, but I think if you could work full time and if you wanna get into real estate investing, I think it's a good plan, but I think you need to have the right team, either a good coach or a good partner. No, I would agree I, because if you're not a subject matter expert on real estate, but you're making money and you're funneled into like this team that you're talking about, that makes all the sense in the world. Right. Now, that's on the that's on the flip side, but uh, you know I have a, a multi million dollar real estate portfolio that we discussed, and I've got rental income that's coming through, and that like talk about right. income and 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 how powerful that is with real estate because not only do you get if you have tenants can they pay most or all of the mortgage, but you have the appreciation and then you have the passive income. Talk about that and explain that for the people that don't understand that. Sure. Well, I think that you know that model better than me because it sounds like you're doing a great job at it. And I've actually avoided the buy and hold for now because I really focused, well, until now, but building the big chunks of capital to buy those rental properties. And now we're starting to do that. Um, What I like about that, like you said, is that the tenant is paying down the principal. The tenant is covering just about everything. If you buy right, because that's the number one rule, you make your money when you buy. And I would Let me say that again. You make your money when you buy. If you don't buy at the right price, you can never make up for it. So again, like work work with people that know what they're doing, have a good coach or a good partner that could help you buy the property at the right price. Because some people buy rental properties and they're actually in the negative. So it's possible to make a bad rental property investment. Like you really do need to get good advice and buy right because you're going to have a ton of expenses. As you know, you have taxes, you have, you know, utility bills, you know, you have your mortgage, you have other other fees. So you buy right, put good tenants in there, screen your tenants really well, let them pay down the mortgage. Hopefully you can make a little bit of money on it as well, depending on how big your mortgage is and, um, and just cash flow. And like I said, we're getting into that now, like we're heading into contract on a 34 unit in Jacksonville. The way that we buy rental properties, I will give you my side of it is that we buy value add properties, properties that need work, right? So we're buying them at 50% of the value. So we're looking at a property that we're going to be buying for 1.4 million. And once we fix up each unit, it could potentially be worth 2.5 or 3 million. So something like that is we'll go in, we'll put probably seven or 10,000 into each unit. I think we're thinking we'll probably spend about 350. So we may be all in for just under 2 million. And we could either flip that development for 2.5 or just keep it in cash flow. Um, I think the cap rate on that will be about 12% because we may actually do a government housing and turn it into section eight housing, which, which is guaranteed money paid by the government, which I think is good to do, especially at a time like right now with COVID and people not paying rent and a lot of issues with within that world. Um, But I do think rental properties are the way to go in the future, Uh, but you really need to know what you're doing. Absolutely. I, talking uh, about Cardone and one of uh, Cardone's strategies, which I love, is that a lot of people have misinformation. You mentioned Robert Kiyosaki from Rich Dad Poor Dad. This is a right. thing is that you know uh, your primary residence isn't an asset. It's a liability. The amount of money that you're putting into that shit, you know, it's not mm-hmm. – and so, you know, what, what Grant Cardone talks about is instead of buying your first house and creating a, a liability, you know, basically try to find a duplex or a triplex and move in there. Mm-hmm. A, a name. Um, we have a, a, you know, a young car salesperson. His name is Corey Ott. He works at, at a Kia dealership in, in Freehold, New Jersey, and he's lighting up. He's 19 years old and he lives at home. 
And so I'm like, Corey, you know, what you can do with all the money you're making, if you're making, you know, nine to $12,000 in a month, freaking selling cars as a 19 year old. Are you kidding me? I was in federal prison at 19. I wish I had the opportunity you do take that. And you could either choose to stay at mommy and daddy's house and put tenants in, in both units or in all three units, depending if you have a, a duplex or a triplex, or if you want, you could turn around and, and live in the, the bigger unit yourself or the small unit, whatever you want to do, and then rent out the other place. That way, either your tenants will pay the majority of your mortgage or they can pay theoretically your full mortgage and you are able to now start you know, um, acquiring uh, equity in that property as well as a passive mm-hmm. income stream that's coming through. So I love Cardone's philosophy on that, especially for car people. There's a lot of young people, millennials that still live at home, which is cool, or they're living mm-hmm. in, you know, uh, an apartment like my daughter. I was like, why are you paying rent to somebody else? Pay rent to yourself at least. Your thoughts on that? Mm-hmm. Well, the one thing I thought of earlier that I didn't mention was when I lived in my aunt's garage and I got my first job. Well, first I started as a design intern and then they hired me right away and then things started to change. When I got that first paycheck, I was like, well, let me buy a new car because I lost my license. It was just this whole mess. But that was part of the story as well. I was like, let me buy a car. But then I said to myself, why don't I save the money and see what I could do with it? And I ended up saving a ton of money living in that garage and then i bought my first property now i did buy a primary residence but it was a condo that i fixed up and then i ended up going to the rich dad poor dad conference and i learned that the primary residence was actually a liability not an asset so i was like now i have to sell this thing that's when i sold it and that's when i started flipping property so um it was good that i started and got that condo but then i quickly learned like you said it was just a liability but um the one thing that i thought of earlier that i forgot to mention is when I was living in that garage, I became completely obsessed. And that was another thing that I relate to what Grant Cardone says is you need to be completely obsessed with your goal and do whatever it takes. And when I was living in that garage, I was like, you know, I didn't, I didn't party. I didn't go out. I didn't date. I didn't do anything. I brought my lunch to work every day. I saved every penny that I possibly could to buy that first property. And I don't believe in just saving money because basically cash is losing value by sitting in the bank. I think you should be investing, but I had to save up that first initial nest egg in order to buy that first property. And then I just kept rolling it over. And to touch on what you said again about the primary residences, I actually live in a rental right now. I chose to put all my money into my investments and I don't even have a primary residence. At one point I sold everything. I sold my car. I lease a car now. I sold my property. I rent a property now. Now I may, I may buy a house eventually, but right now it's just, I'm, I'm all in 100% in, completely obsessed about investing as much as possible and uh, making as much money as possible and the people around me. That's freaking awesome. And I know a lot of people that are in real estate that are doing exactly the same thing. A lot of wealthy people lease or rent their primary residence. They get to, it's, it's like leasing a figgity fat car. You're going to be able to get more house right? With less aggravation, you don't have to worry about anything. You know what I mean? Like it's not your problem. Right. You could live a nice place. And with your money, your hard money, you could invest it in, in owning. If you're going to own real estate, it's to be able to get you know income out of it, in my opinion. If you're in the- right in the wealth acquisition stage, LA. Yeah, absolutely. So you guys are absolutely killing it. So this is the kind of stuff that we need to be listening to. This is the kind of uh, material, the kind of education that we're talking about. So again, the millionaire car salesman, you guys are getting a million dollar education right now. Powerful stuff. Okay. Can you do me a favor? Some books. Okay. What are, what are John, you know, books that have influenced you that you love You, you, let's go through the list of all of them that you think are awesome. Sure, sure, sure. Well, the first one was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And not only was it good for investing, but it changed my whole way of thinking, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it just changed the whole way that I look at money. And it just changed the whole trajectory of my life into investing, which I thought was amazing. Um, I think also How to Win Friends and Influence People, I think was a very good book as well. It, It actually taught me about relationships. What was that? Karen's favorite book. Great book. Great book. Um, Think and Grow Rich, I think was a great book. Yep. Um, obviously, obviously, 10X was an amazing book. Um, and now, 
I actually just read another book recently. It's an older book. It's The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. They also have The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, which I think is another great book. It teaches you about systems. And right now I'm implementing systems. Like right now I'm at my office in Garden City, New York, and I was just interviewing a new assistant. I'm now building out a team for my real estate sales business. I built a team for my wholesale business. I built a team for the investment business, and now I'm doing it for the sales business. So I think systems and teams are very important, and that's what I'm starting to to do now to really scale the business. Um, but I would say that those are my favorite books. Okay, so how can someone get a hold of you if they wanted to either invest in real estate or if they wanted a you know they wanted a real estate coach? How could people get a hold of you? Sure. So Instagram is great. It's just my name. It's John J O H N dot Mick Sherry, which is M C S H E R R Y. Um, I'm also coming out with a um, a coaching program, which I talked to you about that I've been working on for two years, but I've been too busy working on the business to work on teaching it. And that's uh, Millionaire Flip Secrets. I already have everything built out and the Instagram has been up for, for two years, but now we're going to put it into play now that I'm building the systems out. So we could talk more about that if you're interested. And Facebook is just my name, just John Baron McSherry. Um, I would just reach out to me that way if you guys want to talk real estate. Absolutely. So uh, you said Millionaire Flip Secrets? Yes. And awesome. Yeah. All right. So before we wrap up, I want to give you the the uh, the uh, last word. I want you to basically to speak to the tens of thousands of automotive professionals and hopefully hundreds of thousands of other people are going to get this on replay on the podcast and the Millionaire Car Salesman Group on my YouTube channel. Just what advice do you have for somebody that's interested in getting into real estate and just being successful, not only in real estate, but successful in life. So I want to, that's, I want to prep you and I want you to close out today's episode in the show just by, again, what advice do you have for somebody that wants to get involved in real estate and wants to be successful, not only in real estate, but it's successful in life. Well, again, I think it goes back to talk to everybody and tell them what you do. I'll tell you that I made my biggest deals at the coffee shop, walking into the coffee shop and smiling at somebody with my son where I ended up buying a property for 480 and selling it for 880 or that person then referred me to somebody else. The point is talk to everybody, tell them what you do, be passionate about what you're doing, do whatever it takes, be obsessed about it. And it's really just about finding financial freedom. You know, the opportunities are out there, but you have to go for it. No one's going to hand you anything. Nobody hand me, handed me a thing. Like after I fell flat on my face, I, I had to rebuild everything, find the answers um, network as much as you can. As soon as this COVID thing is over, just get out, go to as many events as you can. I've made great connections with, with, with lenders, with partners, get out and talk to people. I think that that's the best advice that I could give you. Find an interest. Um, and real estate will give you financial freedom to build generational wealth, which is something that I think we're, we're all after so that we can do what we want to do when we want to do it. I finally have that freedom today. And for me, I tell people, people this all the time. You know, I'm happy, but I'm never satisfied. And every day I wake up like I'm broke and I just work my face off. I work, I wake up like I'm jobless and I just hustle. Um, I try to build as many relationships as possible, love as many people as possible and just enjoy the human interaction. I love dealing with people. Like I used to sit behind a desk as a graphic designer with no interaction whatsoever. I was never a trained salesperson. I just, I, I found love in interacting with people, getting to know people. And I think it doesn't matter what business you're in, whether it's real estate or car sales, if you're just interested in helping people and, and enjoying the process of them finding success, you will find success as well. That's absolutely phenomenal. So, man, I'm telling you, you are absolutely killing it. And the listeners, man, I'm telling you, you are the average of the five people who you spend the most time with. And you've just been hanging out with Mr. John McSherry, L.A. Williams, and the millionaire car salesman himself, Mr. Sean V. Bradley. Man, listen, take this advice and go out there and be a millionaire car salesman. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks for joining us, John. Thank you, guys. So there you have it, the Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast. This podcast comes to you every week from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. If you have a question about the show or would like the chance to become a guest, feel free to contact us directly at 856-546-2440 or email us at millionairecarsalesman at gmail.com. This program is a presentation of Synergy Records, produced by Tiana Mick and L.A. Williams. Production and engineering by L.A. Williams. 
The Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast is hosted every week by L.A. Williams and the millionaire car salesman himself, Sean V. Bradley. The Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast can be found everywhere, so please don't forget to review, subscribe to, and share the show. Thanks for listening to the Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast, and remember, where I'm from, money provides options. The Millionaire Car Salesman Podcast is sponsored in part by Dealer E Process, VinQ, and AutoWeb. If you enjoyed this podcast, then make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and leave us a review. You know, let some other folks know about it. Oh, and don't forget to join the Millionaire Car Salesman Group on Facebook. We'll see you there.